Now on BBC One, later than scheduled, Patrick Moore goes back to basics in The Sky at Night. Good evening. I must begin on a very sad note. Since our last program, we've lost one of our greatest astronomers, Sir Fred Hoyle. He'd be badly missed, not only by his many friends, whom I'm proud to have been one, but also by scientists all over the world. Fred was, above all, a man of ideas. Some of them were unorthodox. He could be wrong when others were right, but more often, he was right when most other people were wrong. He made many contributions to stellar evolution, a splendid writer, splendid broadcaster, a brilliant popularizer, and remember, he joined me on the sky at night on many occasions. Well, I suppose he's best remembered for his theories about the origin of the universe. He never did believe in the Big Bang, and he was one of those who had what we call the steady state theory. Well, that's no longer accepted in its original form, but nevertheless, his contribution to cosmology were absolutely outstanding. And we thought, as a tribute to Fred, we'd spend our next two programs in discussing origin, nature, and evolution of the universe. Will it expand further? Will it end in a big crunch? Will it end at all? These are things we don't know, and Fred studied them. After all, our galaxy contains a hundred thousand million stars, and we can see a thousand million galaxies. The universe is vast. But how did it all begin? I'm joined again now by Chris Lintot, who's much more of a cosmologist than I am, and will spend the rest of your life studying it, but I'm far happier mapping the moon. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you very much. You know, there was a time when our universe was regarded as both finite and static. That's right. The first ideas that there may be problems with this could be traced right back to Kepler, but they're really popularized by a na man named Olbers, a medical doctor in Germany in the 19th century. His reasoning went something like this. If you imagine a series of spherical shells extending outwards into space from the Earth, with the Earth at the center, yes. each one's the same thickness. Now, even though they're the same thickness, as you increase the radius, the volume increases. In fact, if you double the radius, the volume gets four times as large. So you get four times as many stars in each shell. Now, as we get more distant from the Earth, the brightness of the stars, as we see them, decreases. Yeah. And in fact, if you double the distance, the star appears one quarter as bright. So these two effects cancel out exactly. And each shell contributes the same total amount of light to what we see in the night sky. Right. Now, Olbers realized that if there were infinity of these shells extending outwards, then the night sky should appear bright. And in one of the easiest observations of all time, he realized that he looked up, realized the sky wasn't bright, and concluded there was something wrong. And this became known as Olber's paradox. So what was the answer? Well, it could it be that the starlight was absorbed by dust between us and it? Well, if that didn't work, the dust would itself have radiated, and you're no better off. So there had to be some other answer. That's right, and the answer is that we're not actually seeing into the infinite. It's all rather complex, indeed, it's what we're talking about for the next two programs. But basically, the universe hasn't existed forever, and so the light from the most distant objects hasn't had time to reach us yet. But to find the solution in detail and find some of the evidence for this, we need to go back to 1912 and the work done by Vesto Slipher at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Mm -hmm. Now, he was one of the first to systematically study the spectra of galaxies. Remember, that if you take white light, or indeed any other light, and pass it through a prism, it splits into a rainbow, a rainbow of colors, the constituent parts of the spectrum. And what we see when we look at this are dark lines. These two correspond to the element sodium. Each element has a distinctive signature. And Slipher was the first to find that if you looked at galaxies, the huge majority of them had these lines shifted to the red from where we'd normally expect to find them. We've discussed redshift often enough in the sky at night, and we've just seen a graphic of it. Basically, if a luminous body is moving away, it appears slightly redder than it should do. Well, the actual color change is too slight to be noticed, but it shows up in the spectral lines, and they're all shifted over to the long wave or red end of the spectrum. That shows the object moving away. That's right. And Sleeper didn't take his work any further, but it was left to Edwin Hubble working at Mount Wilson Observatory in the early 1920s to form a historic conclusion. Hubble was working on variable stars known as Cepheids. A variable star is just a star that changes in brightness over time. And the Cepheids are named after the prototype of their class, Delta Cephei. 
which is a northern star. It never sits over Britain. It's not particularly bright, but you can see it with the naked eye easily enough. That's right, and like all Cepheus, it has one particular property. Its period, that's the time between maximum, bright, maximum brightnesses in the light curve, is directly related to its luminosity, its power, if you like. And by knowing its luminosity, and by observing how bright it appears to us in the sky, we can work out its distance, exactly. and that's what makes it in interesting and useful to astronomers. It makes it what's known as a standard candle, something we can use to measure the size of the universe. And of course, Cepheids are very powerful stars. They can be seen over vast distances, so they are very, very useful. That's right, and that's what Hubble did. He detected Cepheids in many nearby galaxies. And from that, he found an interesting relation, which has become known as Hubble's Law. What he found was that the further away a galaxy was, the bigger the redshift, and so the faster the galaxy is receding from us. It's the discovery of the expansion of the universe. Absolutely incredible result. It's important to realize, though, that though from our point of view, it appears like all the galaxies are rushing away from us. There's nothing special about our position. We're not in the center of the universe. Not at all. No. It's rather like the situation on the surface of this balloon on which we've drawn galaxies. Now, as I inflate the balloon, yeah. the galaxies all get further away from each other. You're doing it, yes. That's right. But from the point of view of anyone on one of each of the galaxies, all the galaxies would appear to be rushing away. Now, another important point is that it's not the galaxies rushing apart from each other through space. Yeah. It's space itself that's expanding. Exactly. So the situation is rather like on this, right. this rubber are. strip here. We have the galaxies embedded in space, and then as we expand it slowly, the galaxies appear to be getting f p further apart from each other, but we know it's actually the strip, space itself, that's exactly. expanding. Now, as Hubble began to think about this idea, of course, he realized that in our heads, we can run the expansion back in time. And that brings us back to where the everything started, the Big Bang, which yeah, is well, the start of the idea. Well, you know, it was, um, looking back now, about 13,000 million years to the Big Bang, and it was Fred who coined the term Big Bang, rather scornfully, I think, because he never did believe in it. And it's certainly true that this is an incredible idea, that the universe could have begun in this Big Bang, a primeval explosion. And it needs incredible evidence, but I think we do, we do have that, in addition to the expansion of the galaxies. For example, theorists have been able to calculate exactly what happened in the first few seconds of the universe's existence. Initially, it's believed to have just been a sea of radiation, the temperature far too high for particles to form. But as it expands, it cools, and eventually the temperature drops, within the first second, drops below the temperature to allow protons and neutrons, the building blocks of atoms, to form. As the temperature drops still further, the expansion's continuing, and eventually these can clump together to form the first atomic nuclei. And we can predict exactly how much of each type of nucleus should be produced, how much helium, how much hydrogen, how much deuterium. And it works. And it, it works. It agrees with the observations of what we see in the universe today. But the clinching evidence, oh, yeah. the clinching evidence comes with the cosmic microwave background radiation, which was first discovered in the 60s as a source of interference throughout the entire sky. Now, this is actually the echo of the Big Bang, the echo of the first explosion. And it was predicted by Gamow years before it was disco uh, discovered. As, it ex as the universe has expanded, the radiation's cooled, and it's now at a temperature of about 3 Kelvin, which is about minus 270 degrees Celsius. Definitely chilly. Exactly. But in fact, I've said it's the echo of the Big Bang, but it's not quite the echo of the Big Bang itself. In fact, we're looking back to a period 300,000 years after the Big Bang, before which the universe is described as opaque. And what's happening is this. Before that point, the universe was too hot to allow electrons to be captured by atomic nuclei, which meant that any light trying to cross the universe quickly ran into a fast-moving, free-flying electron. Exactly. And there was no hope of light crossing the universe. We can't see anything if there's no light. Remember, temperature is just a measure of energy. So all we're saying is that the en electrons were too energetic to be captured by the nuclei. Once the temperature dropped past a certain point, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, Electrons were captured, atoms form, and light was free to travel. The universe became transparent. Before that point, before 300,000 years after the Big Bang, there is nothing we can see. There's no light for us to detect. So we may never be able to look right back to the Big Bang. What we've got to do now is to look back as far as we can, and from that, try and work out how fast the universe is expanding. Which brings us on to the all-important Hubble constant. It's amazing how often Hubble crops up in cosmology. It is indeed. This is just a number, but for 70 years, astronomers have been trying to pin down the value of this constant. It's simply defined such that the velocity at which a galaxy is moving away from us is equal to the Hubble constant, remember a number, times the redshift. But 
It's proved very difficult to pin down. In fact, one of the main goals of the Hubble Space Telescope was to try and get an accurate fix on what it is. And in fact, in the last five, ten years, astronomers have begin, begun to move towards agreement on, on what the value is. Now, one of the reasons this is important is we know the size of the universe and the speed at which it's expanding, which the Hubble constant gives us. We can run that backwards like we did with the balloon earlier, and that gives us a value for the age of the universe. The first to realize this was Hubble himself, and he came up with a value of about 1,000 million years. Far too little. Far too low. There's soon apparent there are problems because the oldest stars in the universe, like those in this globular cluster here, yeah. M13 in Hercules, yeah. are believed to be about 10,000 million years. So an obvious problem. And we now think the age of the universe is about 13,000 million years old. One of the reasons Hubble got the value wrong was he wasn't, sure, he wasn't aware there were two different kinds of Cepheids, each with its own law, each with its own relationship between period and luminosity. I remember that very well. It was a meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society, addressed by Walter Bader, who realized there were two kinds of Cepheids, and that altered the entire scale. And in one short paper, he doubled the size of the universe. It was quite a moment. Quite an outcome for one lecture, anyway. It was. Now, the speed of the expansion wasn't constant over time. If you think about it, gravity is pulling everything in the universe together, which slows the expansion. From here, we get to a series of possible alternative futures for the universe. And here we need some terminology, which may sound a bit confusing. Is the universe open, closed, or flat? But don't take that too literally. The universe is not shaped like a pancake. Now, for the real explanation, we need to look at this graph, which plots the time along the bottom axis, on the, on the bottom of your screen there, and then up along the left we have the size of the universe, or the distance of the furthest objects from Earth. Now, the case on the screen at the minute is called an open universe. Now, here there isn't much matter in the universe. Gravity doesn't have much of an effect, and the universe continues expanding forever. On the other hand, if we have lots and lots of matter in, in the universe, we have a, what's known as a closed universe. Gravity is strong enough to slow the expansion completely, stop it, and then it reverses, which brings it back down into what's become known as the Big Crunch, kind of an anti-Big Bang, if you like. There's a third case as well. If the amount of the matter is just enough to slow down the expansion, but not enough to reverse it, just the critical amount, that's known as a flat universe. Astronomers signify these dis different things by the Greek letter omega. Omega equals 1 is fixed, so that's, the s that's that critical density, the flat universe. Omega greater than 1 means a closed universe, too much matter. And omega less than 1 means an open universe, not much matter at all. Currently, all the indicators are that the universe is close to the critical value. It seems to be flat. But remember, that doesn't mean that the universe actually is flat. After yeah. all, it's three-dimensional. And flat is just a mathematical term. To get a better idea of what we mean, you have yeah. to realize that whether the universe is closed, open, or flat affects the geometry. Now, the geometry we all learnt, learnt in school, known as Euclidean geometry, only takes place in certain circumstances. For example, um, we all know that the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees, but look at the surface of this globe here. Yeah, quite different. We have this line going through the meridian, the Greenwich meridian, down to the equator, and we have 90 degree angle formed with the equator. We have a line going through New York and its meridian, forms a 90 degree angle with the equator. Now, the angle between these two lines certainly isn't zero, so the angles in the triangle add up to more than 180 degrees. On the surface of a sphere, different geometry holds sway, and it's like that in different kinds of universe. The flat universe, Euclidean geometry, holds wherever. In a closed universe, the geometry is rather like a three-dimensional equivalent of the spherical geometry, and in an open universe, it's based on what mathematicians call a saddle. So, which is the answer? Open, closed, or, or flat? Which is the right answer? Well, astronomers have been trying to answer that by measuring indirectly the amount of matter in the universe for many years. For example, one ingenious way is to look at the outermost stars in the spiral arms of spiral galaxies. And you'll see, by working out the speed they rotate around the centre, you can weigh everything inside of that orbit and get a measure of the amount of matter in the galaxies. But they've been behaving oddly. Although the conclusion is that the universe is flat, that's what the amount of matter we see shows, the amount of matter we see, the amount of luminous matter, appears to only add up to about 30% of the total in the universe. In other words, every time you go out and look up at the stars, you're missing around 70% of the universe, which we can't see ordinarily. And there's been debate for years about what this dark matter might be. And it's going on even now. Now, for what are the possibilities? One concerns neutrinos. Now, these are strange particles bombarding us all the time, and they've been said to have uh, no charge, and no mass, but they might have just a little mass. And if you train those, do have even a tiny amount of mass. They are so numerous, that might do the trick. 
And then, um, what about brown dwarfs? Stars that are not really stars, never become hot enough to start off the nuclear reactions. Or even um, red dwarfs, many low mass stars. And another idea, it could be this dark matter is what we call non-baryonic. In other words, entirely different to the matter making up you and me, and therefore we can't detect it. And that also is a possibility. So there are all kinds of ideas there, but it, it does seem that dark matter must exist in some form or other. And of course, in cosmology, it's absolutely fundamental. That's right. But whatever it is, there have been other results that pr prove, that show that the universe is flat. For example, studies of the microwave background radiation we talked about earlier. Now, the first fluctuations seen here were detected by the COBE satellite in the early 90s. Now, red are just hotter regions of the sky and blue are cooler ones. But these are the seeds of galaxies we're seeing. These are the structures that will eventually condense to form the universe we see today. Now, recently, the last four to five years, greater resolution, small-scale studies have been done by bo uh, balloon-based experiments like Boomerang, seen here taking off from the Antarctic, Maxima, which you can just see in flight here. You can just see the balloon. You can just see the balloon in the distance. And of course, this has one tremendous advantage. Balloons are cheap. That's right. And they're recoverable. You need to have a spacecraft, and balloon astronomy is becoming more and more important. That's right, although it should be said that further space-borne telescopes are being sent up to study the background radiation oh, yes. soon. But for now, Boomerang and Maxima have come up with stunning results. This is a picture of part of the sky as seen from boomerang. Again, the colours are different temperature. Bearing in mind also, the temperature differences are tiny, a minute fraction of a degree. That's right. But we can compare this to predicted outcomes, predicted results for closed on the left, flat in the middle, and open universes. And remember, of course, when we say a flat universe, we don't mean it's physically flat. It's a mathematical term. But you can see, just by looking at that, the results on the top seem to accept, seem to support that middle picture the fact that the universe is flat. The only trouble is that assuming that the universe is flat presents cosmologists with a bit of a problem. There's a long-held scientific tradition that you don't try and assume that where you are in the universe is special. So what do I mean? Well, we assumed the Earth was special. We assumed it was the centre of the universe, and that turned out to be wrong. Then the Sun. Then the Sun was the centre of the universe, so we now know it's an ordinary star. Then the galaxy. Exactly. We assumed it was the only one, and we've discovered many, many thousands of millions more. So it doesn't mean the theory has to be wrong, but it makes scientists very uneasy. And our universe would be special if omega was equal to 1. I mean, there's nothing in the theory that says it can't be 6 or 0 0.0006. Makes scientists uneasy, and there's nothing to predict why it's that critical value. Why 1? And why should it be nearly 1? That, that is the $64,000 question. And in our next program, we'll go further into this and see whether we can decide um, just how the universe evolves. It's a very fundamental question. Chris, thank you very much. No problem. Don't forget our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash space, or look at CFAX, page 620. And uh, when we come back next month, we'll go further into this question of the origin and history of the universe. So um, watch this space. Good night.